So, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Maybe good afternoon in some part of the world. And some part of the world is good morning. So, we mix it all and we say uh, welcome to everybody in this session, which is organized by the GIS, Gulf Interventional Society. This is the uh, first session this season or first seminar for this season. Uh, and it's our pleasure to start it with a TAVI update and a show of cases. Uh, today we have this session, it's for two hours. Uh, we have great speakers with us. We have Thomas Docher from uh, Royal Brampton. Uh, we have uh, Mohammed Akhtar also from Royal Brampton. And we have from uh, the region, uh, a well-known speakers that you know, Dr. Rachel Bawabi, uh, Dr. Abdullah Al-Anizi from Kuwait, and we have also Dr. Mahmoud Trena from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. So uh, we have uh, a great session ahead of us. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, the chairman of this session. This session, as we said, is organized by the Gulf Intervention Society and in uh, cooperation with Royal Brampton Hospital. Uh, so. Uh, I will not take time in this introduction, but as we mentioned, it's going to be a, a, a series of talks, but base, uh, basically based on cases, it will cover different aspects of the TAVI or TAVR from uh, update and the guidelines, and also about valve and valve, uh, acute coronary syndrome post TAVI, uh, some complications post TAVI as well, and uh, also we'll talk about valve and valve. So we'll try to cover uh, uh, many topics around TAVI and it will be case-based and we welcome your uh, comments and questions in the chat box. So uh, we'll start with the first session with uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Lutcher, who's going to give us a talk about uh, the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines and also the future. So Thomas, please, you can start. And it's our pleasure to have you with us in the first uh, session this season. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do, you, um, uh, do you see my slides? Yes, we do. Very good. So it's a pleasure that, uh, uh, you know, the Royal Brompton uh, is guest of the Gulf Interventional Society and I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, this session by uh, the uh, ESC guidelines on valvular heart disease uh, as a member of the ESC leadership. Now, uh, of course, these guidelines has lots of different topics, as you can see here. Uh, and I will only focus, of course, uh, on the aortic uh, part and in particular on the aortic stenosis uh, rather than regurgitation in the interest of time. We all know that the prevalence of moderate or severe degree valvular heart disease is increasing as we age, uh, particularly after year 50, 55. And the most common uh, valvular heart disease is of course mitral in nature, but also aortic stenosis became a really center stage recently, uh, particularly since the introduction of TAVI. And of course, when you have valvular heart disease of any kind, your outcome is unfortunately still uh, uh, lower than if you don't have it. So uh, aortic stenosis, uh, be it uh, like here, uh, bicuspid in nature or tricuspid, is a disease of elderly in particular, except that the bicuspid uh, aortic stenosis also occurs in much younger people often even in the third or fourth decade of life, while this one is rather in the sixth to eighth decade of life. But both have similar symptoms, uh, as you all know. And of course, uh, uh, the question is, how does this develop? And of course, <clears throat> we just published that in the European Heart Journal, calcific aortic valve disease, like coronary artery disease, has molecular uh, pathways that are Get, uh, being developed recently, uh, 
in part, uh, but still is uh, uh, many aspects are not known. We know that lipoprotein little a in those who have very high levels is crucially involved and in that PCSK9 inhibitors tend to reduce the progression of the disease, but many other pathways are currently uh, uh, evaluated. And I'm sure that in the future, very much like uh, coronary artery disease, we will have medications to delay or even prevent it. But in general, the uh, natural history of, of, uh, of uh, aortic stenosis uh, evolves over decades from a fibrotic to a, um, a stage of microcalcification and then severe uh, calcifications. And as you know well, we really only uh, intervene at the very late stage of the disease process. Uh, we can do this, this is progress, but of course, ideally we would li uh, like to pre uh, delay or even prevent uh, this from occurring. And currently we have lots of different options to treat it, be it with a me mechanical, by uh, prosthetic valves, with SAVR, or with different uh, uh, valves uh, for TAVI. Okay. So the natural history is in fact uh, like this, and we will just come back to the asymptomatic period because there is an asymptomatic period and then suddenly uh, the uh, uh, survival drops sharply when symptoms begin. So we have to catch the patient here but possibly even here, as we will see later on in some of the most recent trials. Currently, symptoms are in the center still of decision-making. According to the guidelines, symptoms such as breathlessness, angina, dizziness, or even exercise-induced syncope. And of course, uh, we can test this because not all patients report symptoms well or don't really go to the end uh, to get symptoms. So an exercise test is something that I commonly do unless it is very clear uh, from the very start. And then of course, echo is of course the central diagnostic tool uh, that we have to use uh, to assess aortic stenosis. And this is also in the guidelines where it says that uh, we need valve morphology from echo, color flow, for regurgitation, uh, continuous wave signals uh, for uh, the jets, uh, and of course, uh, to decide how severe the stenosis is. And as you know, the Bernoulli uh, equation still is the major uh, tool that we use. Uh, we measure, of course, the uh, left ventricular outflow tract, the velocity there, and the maximal velocity and this uh, eventually will give us an aortic valve area, but also the maximal val um, velocity is uh, important in the guidelines as well. These two uh, um, measures therefore uh, are in the guidelines for decision-making. Catherine Otto has published that years ago that a very simple tool, uh, namely uh, determination of Vmax, is crucial in uh, determining the event phase of survival. And of course, if you have uh, less than three meters, three to four meters or four meters, uh, that would add up to a, the gradient of 64 millimeters of mercury in general, uh, markedly determines uh, your survival. Now, these are the guidelines published a year ago uh, at the European Society of Cardiology by cardiologist Alec Vagnon from Paris and uh, Friedhelm Beiersdorf from Freiburg in Breisgau in Germany. And uh, of course, the diagnosis besides ECHOS also recommends to assess uh, coronary artery disease, and they recommend coronary angiography with a 1C if you have a history of cardiovascular disease myocardial ischemia, left ventricular systolic dysfunction are above 40 years on, or postmenopausal uh, and uh, one of uh, the cardiovascular risk factors. They do allow coronary CT angiography if the patient is young and has a very low probability of CAD. The indications for myocardial revascularization with or prior to such an event intervention is recommended with 1C if you have cabbage uh, to combine, uh, if you have a, a, a surgery to combine it with cabbage uh, 
particularly in those uh, that have severe stenosis. If they have less severe stenosis, it's much uh, less strong recommendation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, primary indication for TAVI and coronary artery disease also recommends PCI when uh, the, uh, uh, there is severe proximal stenosis. The uh, uh, approach should be patient-centered in, uh, in nature. So one has to talk to the patient. The patient has to know all the options, the risks and the advantages, the experience with Tavi and Sauver. Uh, and imaging is crucial. And again, the heart team is in the center of recommendation where uh, surgeons and cardiologists, also imagers, and maybe also uh, uh, general cardiologists and, uh, and anesthesiologists should be present. Now, the uh, valve morphology by echocardiography in uh, uh, suspicion of aortic stenosis is essential. If the echo shows, as I uh, uh, indicated er earlier, high uh, um, uh, velocities of more than four meters per second uh, and the mean gradient of more than 40 millimeters of mercury, then of course the probability is very high with uh, that uh, we, uh, surgery or TAVI would be uh, uh, a good option. If there is a low gradient then, and the uh, an aortic valve area calculated of less than one meter per second, then of course they do recommend to determine uh, the flow rate uh, and uh, so, uh, SV of more of, of less than uh, 35 millimeters per minute as an indicator to consider it severe stenosis because as we know we know not only have the normal high gradient stenosis we have also low flow low gradient stenosis that has to be considered then, of course, uh, uh, still, uh, when we um, decided that this is severe aortic stenosis, symptoms are in the center of the uh, decision. And uh, basically, uh, the guidelines do recommend that symptoms uh, uh, should be uh, first considered. And uh, this is, of course, discipline and everything uh, that you know well. Now, if the patient has symptoms, and uh, then, of course, uh, it, he is referred to the heart team. If he has no symptoms or uncertain symptoms and has a left ventricular ejection fraction uh, less than 50%, uh, then if he's physically active, an exercise test is recommended, as I mentioned earlier, because, of course, uh, the uh, history is not always uh, revealed, uh, revealing. And then, of course, if symptoms occur during this test, then again, is referred to the heart team. If, if he's not uh, physically active, then of course uh, decisions are more difficult and patient has to be reevaluated or a stress echo or a like should be uh, considered. Uh, as regards uh, uh, the um, decision for Sauber or uh, Tauber or Tavi, age is still an Im more important decision maker. So according to the guidelines, the limit is at 75 years of age. If you're uh, above it, then uh, the TAVI is the preferred option in general, below it, rather uh, surgery. But in addition to age, it's also the risk score, the SDS from uh, or a Euro risk score, that if it's uh, below uh, 4%, then of course, SAVR is recommended above 8% uh, TAVI. And there is a middle, uh, obviously, where the judgment of the physicians in the heart team are crucial. So let me uh, continue. Okay. Doesn't want to move forward now. God. Sorry. It's blocked at the moment. It's on, that's not, not what I want. Okay, now it moves forward. Sorry about this. Symptomatic aortic stenosis, 1B, intervention is recommended, high-grade aortic stenosis, gradient above 40, velocity in general above 4 meters per second, valve area 1 centimeter square or below. Thomas, sorry, yes? You yes. closed your screen share. Oh, am I so sorry about this? 
Huh. Okay. Now we see it. Yes, we do. Now we see it. All right. Sorry. Okay. So the guidelines for asymptomatic aortic stenosis is uh, something else. And here uh, the guidelines say intervention is recommended in asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis and impaired left ventricle function of no other cause. And uh, those who are asymptomatic during normal activities, but develop symptoms during exercise testing as I, uh, indicated earlier. Management of asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis is otherwise controversial. Now, in the this this shows the old guidelines and the new guidelines, and in terms of uh, symptomatic aortic stenosis, is essentially similar. While uh, for um, symptom asymptomatic stenosis, there is a two A that it can be considered in certain patients. And here is it uh, in in uh, detail. You can see asymptomatic uh, patients with severe uh, aortic stenosis. Intervention is recommended in severe aortic stenosis, systolic dysfunction with an ejection fraction below 50%, uh, 1B. If you go for a lower, uh, a higher ejection fraction, 1C. Now, what about asymptomatic aortic stenosis and outcome? This is very controversial in nature still, but there are a few interesting uh, uh, trials that I would like to share. Here, 145 patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, but severe in, the, in terms of echo and a, a huge gradient. And this is from the Korean group. And you can see operative mortality or deaths from cardiovascular uh, uh, causes. This is a small trial we have to consider. So it's only a hypothesis generating, but early surgery was much more favorable also from deaths of any cause. So this has to be considered in the future. The AVATAR trial uh, looked at patients with an uh, aortic valve area below, sorry, a wrong symbol, below one centimeter square, they max above four meters, DP max uh, of 40 millimeters mercury or, or higher. And here again, you can see that the MACE rate was higher uh, if uh, with conservative treatment waiting for symptoms than with early uh, surgery with a log rank test p-value of 0 0.021. Uh, they went further to look at mortality from any cause. Again, this was lower, although not significant, but the tendency to lower uh, 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 occurrence and hospitalization for heart failure as well not quite significant. Again, this is a small trial with around 150 patients. So primarily hypothesis generating. And here again, we see the same thing in terms of deaths. Then of course, we also have to consider what we do after uh, aortic valve replacement. Once the Tavi is in uh, or any mechanical heart valves for surgery, and I show first uh, the surgical uh, trial, the realign trial published by Franz von der Werf some years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. And here you can see that again, uh, uh, against our uh, expectations, uh, warfarin was significantly better in, uh, in terms of first thromboembolic event and also in terms uh, uh, of, of bleeding events, uh, uh, surprisingly enough, compared to the noac dabigatran So we can say that indeed warfarin remains the treatment of choice in uh, patients that receive mechanical heart valves in the aortic position. With TAVI, of course, as you all know, we have hypoattenuated leaflet thickening in TAVI valves that are difficult to detect with echo. But with echo, you may uh, observe uh, the reoccurrence of a, a gradient across the TAVI valve. But with CT scan, the uh, thrombus formation can be detected. Therefore, it seemed logical to uh, use a NOAC in the Galileo trial to prevent this and to assure long-term functionality of TAVI valves. 
the possible important of half valve, of course, is valve dysfunction, but also stroke. Although this is controversial, depending on the registry we look at, peripheral emboli, and uh, the question is whether endocarditis would be more common in these patients. Well, anyway, they tested in this uh, particular Galileo trial, rivaroxaban, uh, where it's a, a standard care for the primary efficacy endpoint and the primary safety endpoint. And amazingly enough, uh, both were uh, in favor to antiplatelet group as we currently do it with aspirin and clopidogrel or alike compared to rivaroxaban. So the rivaroxaban patients uh, uh, bleeded more, they had more uh, overall events, and the mortality was also increased. This was a very surprising finding and said that uh, we should not use NOAX after TAVI. There is a new trial published in uh, the European Heart Journal just recently. This is uh, based on intention to treat uh, um, analysis for the primary endpoint of time to death, stroke, MI, systemic embolism, intracardiac or uh, other thrombosis, and major bleeding. And you can see that compared to standard of care as we do it today, abixaban tended to be a bit lower after uh, more than 200 days, but it was not statistically significant. And here uh, also for the safety analysis, uh, 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 abixaban was not any uh, different to antiplatelet therapy. And in those that had uh, a vitamin K antagonist for indications such as atrial fibrillation, they were also alive. So it appears that NOAX don't provide any uh, real benefit in aortic stenosis. What happens if anticoagulation with uh, uh, or without uh, clopidogrel is tested after TAVI in patients that have an indication? There's another trial out of uh, Holland where they actually looked at the uh, cumulative percentage of patients with bleeding. So this was more of a, a uh, safety trial with about 250 patients. And you can see over one year time period, oral anticoagulation alone without clopidogrel uh, really had much less bleeding than anticoagulation of clopidogrel. Other uh, uh, endpoints were not tested uh, because of uh, the size of the trial. So with this, uh, I would like to end by saying that the ESC guidelines provide a, a very uh, easy and uh, important uh, guideline for the treatment of patients with aortic stenosis from a diagnosis using uh, echo and uh, if required also coronary angiography to the selection of the right approach between SAVR and TAVR uh, in uh, using the heart team. And also more recently, we have some trials that in the future will probably change our current recommendations uh, to be more cautious uh, uh, with patients with uh, asymptomatic aortic stenosis, because as you recall, symptoms, age, and the uh, risk score are currently the major determinants for the decision to go ahead for an intervention and to decide of uh, Sauber versus Tower. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lutcher. Thank you very much for this uh, update uh, about the guidelines in Tavi or Tower. Uh, so, as uh, we have agreed, uh, the questions will be at the end of uh, all the talks. We'll have time for Q&A session. Uh, now we'll move to our next title. It's uh, non-STEMI post-TAVI valve and valve. So it's not just post-TAVI, it's valve and valve non-STEMI. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague and one of the stars in the region, uh, Dr. Rachel Bowardi from Jeddah, from the National Guard Hospital. So, uh, uh, Rasha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'm not sure if you're able to see my slides. Good? We do see it. Perfect. All right. Uh, yes, just to make things more complex, we decided to choose a case that will... Uh, 
make you struggle even when you're reading the slides too. Uh, so this is a 70 year old gentleman who has shortness of breath, presented with shortness of breath and non-STEMI about a year ago. His prior history has lots of comorbidities, uh, including hypertension, diabetes, CKD, AFib, and coronary artery disease, which I'll touch upon as well in the next slide, and aortic stenosis with TAVI. He also has ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 40 to 45%. So his uh, PCI history is a bit more complex as well. He has, in 2002, had LED PCI, and then subsequently in 2016, had more intervention to the right coronary artery and the LED. Um, the LED is pretty much a metal jacket. Um, and then in 2018, his symptoms were mostly related to aortic stenosis. He underwent cath, which found that he had uh, LED CTO, PCI was attempted, but failed and treated him medically. Now in two 2018, that's when he got his TAVI, which um, I'll explain more in the next slide. So um, as you can see on the left-hand screen, the first TAVI implantation, slow implantation, but just uh, really focus on how the valve migrated to the top and um, during the last couple of seconds. So I'll play it again. You can look again, the heavily calcified valve started a bit um, low, and then you can see right here where the valve jumped. So aside from the valve being shallow, now we also have significant perivalvular leak. And the operator at that point decided that it wouldn't, even if they ballooned it, we already have a valve that's already right at the annulus. Um, and decided to go ahead and put a valve in valve. This was a 29, they went ahead and put a 29 valve. Um, sorry, just going back. Um, but this time started deeper. So this is just a, an image, not a video. Um, and they went ahead and deployed the valve deeper. Now they still had significant paravalvial leak, went ahead and post dilated with good results. So fast forward from 2018 till um, a year ago, he was doing pretty well. Um, but this time he presented with shortness of breath, found to have non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. His initial troponin were negative, uh, but then went up to and peaked around 800s. Um, he had on his echo worsening inferior wall um, with an EF close to his baseline around 40 to 45%. So here's where the struggle is. Um, so bottom to four coronary angiography, um, initial goal was to start with a radial, but he has poor radial access, so went switch to femoral. Uh, now you can see from the left-hand side, uh, tried with a JL35, which is usually our go-to for um, left coronaries, and uh, not much of luck. And then you've got um, an EBU, also not much of luck with a selective. Now, what you have to keep in mind is also, you also have an old, the, the first TAVI with a skirt, that it, um, because it migrated up, it's actually in your way. So uh, uh, covering uh, some parts of the uh, the coronary. And then you have another valve, and this is before the uh, um, commercial alignment. So uh, there is a chance that the two valves are actually misaligned and then you've, you're stuck in between the struts. Uh, so the decision with the left, we know that the LED is occluded um, right where the stents are and the circ is small and non-dominant. So a non-selective image that you can see here showed that there is flow and most likely the culprit here is the right coronary artery. Now the right coronary artery is also another struggle. So you can see where the right coronary artery comes off. You can see that um, obviously you have the two um, valves, but it, the region might be actually down at the bottom of the first one. And there is actually a bifurcation lesion. So the selection here was done with a JR4 catheter. It is a five French though, and um, got it close to the ostium and then um, did the technique with the wire and air mailing the wire and then following it, following the catheter um, after the wire with the two wires in place. So got a Xi'an blue wire first and then a, uh, a pilot uh, that was used for the PDA. Now, I was successful to get the guide deep down to the coronary, obviously making sure that the pressures are fine and able to wire the PDA here with a, uh, with a, a pilot. So ballooned into the PLV, uh, which was the major branch. Um, and if the PLV had no, no significant recoil, one option would be to do a drug coated balloon. Just to, to keep in mind that with a five French guide here, you won't be able to do kissing balloon inflation. So you're kind of stuck with um, choices of, of techniques here. So um, after get, getting flow down to the two vessels, um, decided to go ahead and do a drug coated balloon to the PDA and a stent into the PLV just because of significant recoil. 
So here's what you can see after um, the the uh, the uh, this is before the drug coated balloon. And given the territory was small, figured drug coated balloon will do it. And actually, there was a better um, uh, better segment here from the PDA osteum and stented into the PLV given the significant recoil. However, this is what happened: is that we've lost the branch um, in the PDA branch here. So if you may allow me, I will just stop here. I just wanted to hear what the panelists would do at this point. Okay, Thomas, what do you think? Uh, you are clear. mute, yeah. Uh, what about trying to rewire uh, the, uh, the branch uh, through the stent? And because you have a stent in there, right? What what stent right. is it? So this is an old stent. Um, this patient had a PDA stent back in. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So this is only the ballooning here. Correct, correct. Just ballooning to the osteum. Yeah. Um, initially, there was flow, and uh, it was after putting in a stent in the PLV is when we lost the PDA. And uh, why did you lose the wire? You retracted it because. Oh, so this. No, this is actually a good, yeah, exactly. At the time of the stent, um, it was taken out. Yes. Uh, I'll show you in a second after we rewire it. Um, yeah, sorry. I would rewire yeah. it anyway, yes. Yeah. So a little bit more details after that, but um, if anybody has any other suggestions, what would you, would you leave the guide as is? Would you switch the guide? You've got a five French. So if you go in and wire the PDA, um, it would, would you just leave it without the kissing balloon inflation? Because if you need a kissing balloon inflation, you'll have to upside, upgrade your guide to six French. Can we hear from Abdullah? Abdullah, what do you think? Uh, you know, to be honest, I think the, the, the vessel, the PDA vessel was very small before the intervention. So any intervention you will do afterward will be, will complicate things. And I don't think it will be worth it to, to change the guide or, one maybe small thing I'll try is to do a pot prior to the ostium of the PDA and see that if, if that would help flow in the PDA and just wire it and do a, a pot and see if that will improve things. And maybe use a small balloon uh, into the PDA just to create some flow, like 1.5 balloon. But you know, if you look at the vessel, I would not try too hard, especially yeah. if the patient is stable and not having symptoms. Does he have symptoms at this point? Excellent. So exactly what came into mind is if he had symptoms um, or any ECG changes, I would have been a bit more aggressive. Um, one strategy is to have two coronaries in there and switch your guide to a six French. That way um, you can be, you're, you'll be able to not only balloon the, uh, the PDA, but you can also do um, kissing balloon inflation as well. Uh, pot was done, unfortunately not much of a change. But um, I would have to say that sometimes doing less is more in this case. So at this point, he had no chest pain, no ECG changes, hemodynamically stable. And we've got other reasons to kind of push us away from doing cats. His creatinine is 140 baseline. Um, and this is at the time of a peak at our hospital too. So he was also tested COVID positive. So decided to treat him medically, but bring him back if he had any symptoms or ECG changes, which uh, was not the case. And if we I, had to come back. I think it's a very wise decision, especially given his high creatinine and uh, and patient is hemodynamically stable, no ECG changes, no symptoms. Exactly, exactly. So one lesson for me was that um, being a bit more aggressive with the guide going in with a six French. So if you get luck, stay there um, or switching the guides if we had to. So um, he was treated medically, had no, no chest pain, ECG changes, um, and the, the decision at the, uh, on the table if he had chest pain was to switch guides and rewire the PDA and do uh, ballooning, kissing balloon inflation and stent if needed. Um, this was his final image, and you can see good flow to the PLV um, and the PDA obviously it's occluded. So on follow-up, he has been seen in clinic and he is actually doing really well, no angina and um, no, no further admissions since then. Uh, just before I end, I just want to show a few slides just about the, the scope of the problem. Uh, now that we're doing TAVIs more on a younger population, we'll be seeing more and more of coronary artery disease in the future. 
And this was the reaccess trial, which is, which is probably the largest uh, trial that looked at coronary access after TAVI. And what they did is that they, at the same setting, they cannulated both the left and the right. And this was done obviously femoral, given that the TAVI was done at the same time, and then moved on to the TAVI part and then re-attempted to recannulate both the left and the right. And as you can see that there is unsuccessful can cannulation in about 7.7% of the population. Uh, their population is about 300 patients. And 22 uh, out of those 23 patients had Evolute R or Evolute Pro. So we know that majority of these cases are most likely with the Evolute than Sapien. Uh, there are smaller uh, re samples or small registries that looked at uh, really difficult engagement as, as high as 25% um, of selective engagement in the right, and they noticed that right was more than the left. Um, but in this case, it seems like both the left and the right in, in some of these cases. What they saw is also there is a significant radiation increase to the operator, and there is a, a significant increase in contrast as well to the patient. Um, what we don't know is that we know that commercial alignment maybe would help in terms of the, um, the selective engagement. However, with our pro techniques that we do nowadays, we also aim for a higher implantation uh, to prevent paravalvular leak and to prevent the use of pacemaker. But that in, it, in itself in the reaccess trial has been shown to be one of the factors that um, creates an, an uns unsuccessful cannulation. So it creates another issue as well in terms of coronary access. Um, a couple more slides on this topic is that when we look at coronary access, we look at multiple factors affecting it. Mo some of them are anatomical from the patient uh, itself. So sinus tubular junction, uh, that's where you're actually going to be manipulating your catheters from top, sinus height, the leaflet bulkiness. Um, sinus of valves alpha width and the coronary height all play a role, and also device uh, selection, which we talked about with the Evolute being more of an issue than uh, Sapien, but also the ceiling skirt height, which is 13 millimeter uh, in, in Evolute, and the valve implantation depth. Um, the uh, group from Sinai published this article back in 2018. Um, it's not meant to be exactly that you should follow, but it just gives you a bit of a guidance They've got uh, two, two um, charts for both a coronary angiogram and for PCI um, in a metronic valve. What they, the emphasis here is that you could use your J-wire to get into the diamond um, and then follow it up with your guide or your diagnostic catheter. And um, the choice of catheters in most of the cases are JL3.5 and then JL4 if you need to after and JR4 for right coronary. So similar to what we typically do. And then um, other maneuvers that you can use is using your guide wires, balloon support and guide extension if you're going for PCI. Um, just a final slide here on some few tips and tricks as well. So keep in mind the skirt of the Evolute is about 13 millimeter. So to be above the skirt, so your aim is to come from above, um, it's about two and a half alternating diamonds. Uh, the engagement in one of the articles mentioned that they're most of the time they're successful when they're entering into the fifth diamond. Um, but the whole idea is that you're trying to catch it from the top, not from the bottom because of the difficulty of um, guide manipulation and entrapment uh, concern as well. Um, the choice of catheter, most likely it's JL3.5, sometimes it's more successful than um, a JL4 and a JR4 for the right. Um, and then using your wire sometimes could help when you're subselective to get you selective. Uh, the, from the reaccess trial, when they looked at the tight choice of catheters, but then keep in mind that with the reaccess trial, they also had Sapien, which does not really affect your coronary um, catheter choice as well. But it turns out that JL3.5 uh, was used more after uh, than before. And as far as the JR was mo mostly used in both cases, but then there's also a use of uh, multipurpose after. So with that, I conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rachel Bawardi for this uh, interesting case. Uh, it's quite an unusual case and managed very well. Uh, now we'll move to the next uh, speaker. Uh, our colleague and my friend, Dr. Abdullah Al-Anizi, uh, from Kuwait. He's the chairman of the cardiology chest hospital in Kuwait, who's going to present uh, another complicated case, which is valve involved with risk mitigation. So uh, Abdullah, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Thank you, dear Fahed. I'm uh, working on trying to get the, uh, my slides. Can you see my slides? Not yet. Okay. Um, okay, let me see what I can do. We just see a smart face on the screen. Okay. That's probably Russia's face. <laughs> <laughs> can, you see, can you see it now? Yes, we do. Perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Fahed, for this kind of introduction and uh, thank you for this invitation. Um, uh, and also thank Dr. Rush and Dr. Thomas for their nice presentation. So I've been asked to present a case on uh, valve and valve. So um, this is what I'm going to do. So the case that we have today is an 84 year old uh, gentleman with significant past medical history. As you can see, he has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, he has a chronic kidney disease asthma, obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP, and has chronic anemia. Uh, he presented back in 2011, so about 11 years ago, with CCS class 3 symptoms. Uh, he underwent investigation and workup and was found to have severe aortic valve stenosis and triple vessel disease. So after that, he underwent surgical aortic valve replacement using a 21 millimeter uh, magna device and coronary artery bypass. He had the Lima to LAD, and uh, Y graft vein to RPDA and OM3 branch. He did well until we saw him about uh, a year and a half ago, so January 2021. He again presented with CCS class uh, three and New York Association class three, four symptoms. At that time, his ECG showed sinus rhythm with uh, left anterior fascicular block. He had an echocardiogram that showed normal LV systolic function, but he actually had a critical aortic valve stenosis with a mean gradient of 70 millimeters mercury and aortic valve area of 0.6. So really, really tight uh, uh, biprosthesis stenosis. And that was presentation at a different hospital. He underwent coronary angiography there, which showed patent grafts, but the left main continued to supply significant uh, territory. And that's really important to have in mind. So this is the coronary angiogram that was done at the uh, uh, hospital where he presented. Um, as you can see, uh, the Magna device with the fluoroscopic uh, print, this is an injection of the uh, RCA, uh, which uh, you clearly you can see it's above the surgical valve, but it uh, has a total occlusion distally. And uh, thankfully, it's been revascularized with the graft. This is a picture of the uh, left main, and this is a very important picture. I mean, if I only had this picture, I know this patient is at extreme risk of left main occlusion if he underwent valve and valve uh, procedure, because you can see that the left main is below the, the or at the level of the valve, and it's really close to the uh, surgical valve. And as I said, you can see it's supplying a very large uh, OM2 and, and a reasonable size OM1. The OM3 at the bottom, you can see, maybe I'll point with this, you can see this is have competitive flow from the vein graft here, but this region is not uh, revascularized. And the next picture, you can see that the LED is occluded at the mid-segment. So the lima is unable to have a retrograde flow to supply that first diagonal, which is uh, uh, important, I think, in this case. It's another picture of the LED showing that the LED is totally occluded at the mid-segment. This is the lima. It's not a perfect picture, but at least it shows that the uh, lima is patent to the mid-LED. This is another picture of the lima. This is the vein graft. That's a way, why, uh, sorry, this is still the lima. This is the vein graft to the uh, RPDA and, and to the OM3 branch. So at this point, we discussed uh, this case at our heart team meeting uh, in terms of how to proceed after this pain, the patient has been referred to our hospital. So the options, of course, at this point is either to do a redo SAVR and versus valve in valve TAVR. Um, you know, given the patient age being 84, multiple comorbidities, the fact that the patient has a patent lima that would be, of course, at risk if you do a redo uh, surgery, uh, we thought that the best option for this patient would be valve and valve TAVR. So why we're talking about valve and valve? So the valve and valve TAVR has some pros and cons. So the advantages of valve and valve, it's a great and attractive alternative to redo open heart surgery. And when it's compared to native valve TAVI, it's been associated with less conduction delay, uh, less paravalvular leak, and less contrast. And actually, in some cases, these cases can be do done with zero contrast because you can rely on the frame of the surgical valve to, to deploy your TAVR. 
but the, it has also associated with some risks. It's, it has increased risk of coronary occlusion, uh, PPM, which is patient prosthesis mismatch, especially if the surgical valve is small, like 19 or 21, which is the case uh, in, in our patient. And it can be associated with some increased risk of stroke because these bioprocesses, they tend to calcify and have heavy calcifications. Although looking at some multiple meta-analyses, meta uh, the risk of stroke has been similar to a uh, uh, native valve tabby. So as part of uh, workup, uh, CT was done, which I think is paramount in, in the assessment of these cases. Uh, looking at the access, uh, we have a good access with bifurcation being below the femoral heads bilateral. You can see there's some calcifications in the uh, abdominal aorta and some in the left common iliac. Here on the left hand or right hand side of the screen, we are measuring the ID of the surgical valve, which is 90 millimeter, which is expected uh, uh, for a 21 uh, magna valve. So even if you didn't have the surgical details from the CT measurements, you can anticipate the size of the surgical valve. Um, on the right hand side, I'm going to show you the ostium of the left main, which is highlighted by this red dot. And you can see that the left main height is below the, the, uh, uh, the post of the surgical valve. And on the left hand side, we measure something called VTC, which is virtual valve to coronary distance. And if this is less than four millimeters, this highlights a high risk of left main occlusion at the time of valve and valve. And in our case, it's actually two millimeters only. So this patient is at extremely high risk of left main occlusion if uh, valve and valve uh, is to be performed. So some sort of protective technique has to be applied in this case to prevent left main occlusion. So go going back to our case, as I just mentioned, this patient is at extreme high risk of left main occlusion, despite being a protected left main having patent lima to LAD. And I think it's important to maintain flow in the left main because it's supplying some area that's not revascularized. And it's also in the future in case uh, uh, some of the grafts go down and you need to get access to the left main. I think it's always important to maintain access. Um, the second part is the patient prosthesis mismatch. This patient has a small surgical valve, a 21 millimeter with an ID of 19 only. So uh, there is high chance that there will be significant residual uh, gradient after TAV, uh, TAV uh, or after valve and valve. So some sort of uh, uh, procedure needs to be performed to optimize hemodynamics. And of course, there's some risk uh, of stroke uh, with, with the valve and valve procedure. So let's talk about each uh, aspect of risk uh, separately. So with regard to the risk of coronary occlusion, one thing that can be done is a procedure called basilica. And it's essentially laceration of the anterior leaflet uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the surgical valve, laceration of the leaflet against the left main and to maintain flow in the left main and prevent occlusion. So one th that's one thing that can be performed. Uh, and this can be technically challenging because it's a little bit uh, uh, complex uh, type of procedure. The other option that can be performed, you see it in the left-hand side, it's something called chimney stenting. And in this case, you leave a stent uh, in the left main. And after you deploy your uh, transcatheter valve, if you see evidence of impaired flow, then you can deploy the stent. And in this picture, you can see there is also a stand that's being parked in the RCA. Uh, th this is a good option as a bailout option. It's not that technically difficult, but it's not perfect because these cases, the short uh, follow-up that have increased risk of uh, restenosis of these stents because they are behind the valve. So this is just a picture showing the uh, basilica on the right-hand side compared to the left-hand side without basilica. So without basilica, you're actually creating a covered stent then uh, that can cause uh, left main occlusion. On the right-hand side, you can see this cut here um, uh, that uh, uh, can help maintain flow into the left main or the RCA after valve and valve. With regards to the patient prosthesis mismatch, one option that can be used to, um, to improve hemodynamic is to use a supraannular valve, like an evolute valve, uh, to have a valve that's higher than the uh, annulus that can help improve the hemodynamics. The other option that's being used more frequently now is the biprostatic valve fracture. And you can see it performed here, in, uh, having a non-compliant balloon inflated at really high pressure. And that will lead to cracking of the uh, inner metallic ring of the surgical valve, as you can see it uh, on the right-hand side. And this is uh, doing CT of one of our cases following fracture. And you clearly see 
the fracture of the surgical valve ring. Um, doing all these procedures, of course, will increase risk of having some debris embolize, increase risk of stroke. So we, we, one option that can be used is uh, cerebral protection to have filters in the main vessels supplying the brain. So going back to our case, uh, we have to have a strategy. First of all, for valve and valve, it's very crucial to know the surgical valve you are using uh, or has been used. In this case, a magna valve that has been used, it's a stented supraannular, uh, supraannular valve, um, and it's important to have the sizes. We went to a valve and valve uh, uh, app, which uh, tells us the exact size of the valve. Uh, it tells you the true ID, which is 19, which is what we saw on the CT. And they've added a nice, uh, uh, more information with the updated version. It tells you that this valve is actually can be fractured because not all uh, surgical valves that can be fractured like Hancock or trifecta cannot be fractured. And it also tells you that the balloon size you need to fracture the valve is 22. An easy way to remember this, it's either you use the labeled size. So if the valve is 21, you either use a 21 or you add one millimeter, like in this case, 22. I th one thing I would love them to add is to tell you what kind of pressure you need to achieve to cause a fracture. So actually the Magna valve is one of the more difficult valves to fracture. You need to achieve 18 to 20 atmospheres uh, uh, at the time of balloon inflation to cause a fracture. Left-hand side, you can see the picture of the valve and this is how it looks on fluoroscopy. In terms of THF, uh, uh, THV uh, size selection or the options, uh, from we decided to use a balloon expandable to optimize the access, given the left main being very low. And the app gives us the option using 20 or 23. Uh, because we are planning to use a fracture and improve the hemodynamics, we decided to use the 23 Sabian S3 valve. So to summarize our strategy in this case, we wanted to use GA with uh, TE guidance. To reduce the risk of stroke, we're gonna use uh, cerebral protection with Sentinel device. We're gonna use valve and valve using a 23 millimeter sapien. To protect left main, we're gonna use basilica. We're gonna have ch uh, chimney stenting as a, as a bailout after we perform the basilica. Uh, and this, because this case was our first case uh, uh, performing basilica. And in terms of our hopes to improve the hemodynamics, we decided to perform a valve fracture following THV implantation. And this is one of the things we can talk about whether to perform a fracture before you implant the transcatheter valve or after. But in, in, in our experience, we always use it after valve uh, implantation in the aortic position. So here we're doing our uh, root angiogram to uh, deploy our Sentinel device. Here we are uh, deploying the uh, filter in the right, uh, the brachycephalic artery. And then we go ahead and deploy the filter in the left common uh, carotid. Following this, um, we go ahead and cross uh, the uh, aortic valve. We, we have a, uh, a snare deployed in the LVOT. Next, we uh, come using an AL guide pointing at the left cusp uh, where we're hoping to perforate. And we use a piggyback microcatheter and a stat wire that will be electrified uh, to be able to perforate the leaflet. And you can see us uh, perforating the leaflet here uh, using uh, uh, 30 uh, power, uh, 30 watts for the perforation. And the plan is once we perforate the leaflet that we will snare the wire to, uh, to perform our basilica. Here we can see us at, um, trying to snare the wire. And here the wire is being snared. And then we create something called V or the flying V, which I'm gonna to point to it here. And this part will be denoted and the electricity of 70 Watts will be exerted. And then we're gonna pull both catheters uh, up to lacerate the leaflet. And you'll see it coming now, applying some pull on that V and you can see us here lacerating the leaflet by pulling both cather catheters up. There you go. So you saw that being pulled up. So now the leaflet has been uh, lacerated and surprisingly the patient was completely stable. 
At this point, we uh, deployed, or uh, sorry, we, we have a, a stent uh, parked in the cirque in case we need to perform chimney in case the basilica was not very successful. At this point, we move our uh, transcatheter valve, being very careful not to interact with our sentinel. And you can see it, we're just next to it, not having any interaction with it. Now we have our valve uh, positioned. Uh, I, have to, I have to say at this point, we could have improved the coaxiality, coaxiality of the transcatheter a little bit better, uh, but I think we have a good position there. Here we start deploying our transcatheter valve. Following uh, the transcatheter valve deployment, we still had a significant gradient of about 17 millimeter, albeit better than 70 that we got uh, that the patient had before the procedure. Now we go ahead and try to uh, fracture the valve and keep, keep your eyes on the surgical valve and see toward the end of the frame how it goes uh, and opens up better. And after the fracture, the gradient dropped to around six. So I'm just showing it one more time. You can see the valve fractures at the end and expands significantly. Following which we do a picture, we find the left knee is still open. So no point, no need to deploy the uh, stent. We remove the stent and here we are just proving that we are able to engage the left main uh, following valve implantation and valve fracture. This is the gradient on the left-hand side after TAVI, but before valve fracture, we still had 18, dropping from 70 millimeters of mercury. And after fracture, we uh, ended up with a single digit uh, gradient, similar to native TAVI. So the patient did well, stayed in hospital two days. Uh, we, for valve and valve, our general practice is to put them on an UAC because we believe they are high risk of uh, uh, valve thrombosis. The patient had significant improvement on his symptoms when you saw him in a 30-day 30, 30 follow-up, and his mean gradient at that time was only 10 millimeters mercury transcatheter uh, on the transthoracic uh, echo. Following that, he lost to follow-up to our TAVI clinic, um, and he was seen uh, at, uh, with, by his primary cardiologist. But since I'm presenting the case today, we called him to, uh, to our clinic last week, uh, continues to do really well, and we performed the uh, transthoracic echo, which showed the valve uh, continues to do well with a normal LV systolic function. This is the flow. This is the five chamber uh, view. And you can see the flow really nice through the aortic uh, valve with a mean gradient of 11.7, so about 12 millimeters mercury. So the valve continues to do well. So to summarize, um, valve and valve is an attractive option uh, when compared to re redo open heart surgery. However, it's associated with some limitations, including uh, risk of coronary occlusion and the patient processes uh, mismatch. However, uh, we have techniques to optimize the result and get a reasonable uh, result uh, without needing to do uh, open heart surgery. However, pre-procedural planning uh, is paramount in these cases. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. This is not just a case of valve and valve. This one has a lot on it uh, talk about risk of coronary occlusion, permanent pacemaker requirement, cerebral protection, and also a valve fracture. I, I'm sure this will create a lot of uh, questions in our uh, Q&A. But for now, uh, I will leave the floor for Thomas to introduce our next speaker, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Farhat. I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Majid Akhtar. Uh, who has some roots in Saudi Arabia, but trained in England uh, uh, and uh, particularly in, at Barts uh, in interventional cardiology and cardio cardiology in general. He then moved to us at the Royal Brompton Hospital. And since last month, he is consultant of interventional cardiology at Harefield Hospital and uh, really a, a person that's also an academic interventionalist. And uh, I'm sure he will provide, present you some uh, interesting cases uh, of TAVI complications and how to manage it. Majid, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Prof. Lusher, and thank you, Chairman. I'm just going to share my slides, which I hope you should be able to see. <clears throat> we'll see so, it well. Thank you. So uh, I've been entitled uh, to give a talk on TAVI complications. 
which is always a difficult one to start off with. It's nice to show a great case of Tavi. It's more difficult to show uh, your less great moments when things go wrong. But nevertheless, as Tavi operators, as you know, it's important that we always uh, you know, hope for the best and plan for the worst. So we know what to do if things don't go the way we anticipated. And I wanna focus on transcatheter heart valve embolization. Now, as you know, you know, there's two different phenomena, there's TAVI migration and embolization. Migration tends to be less of an issue. It's not to minimize its importance, but that's where the transcatheter heart valve moves a few millimeters in either directions, cranially or caudally. So it's not in this optimal position across the aortic valve annulus. And that's important because if it's too low, for example, you have the risk of developing aortic regurgitation. You may have an underexpanded valve that you want to post dilate, but you can't if it's particularly high. You also have the risk of coronary obstruction, and as we've heard from our previous speakers, um, issues with coronary engagement. We know that a low valve uh, implantation not only causes aortic regurgitation, but also predisposes to conduction tissue abnormal uh, problems and, and the risk for permanent pacemaking. Now, in migration of the valve, you could consider a valve in valve scenario where you have two transcatheter heart valves uh, literally done in one index procedure to try stabilize the suboptimal position of the first valve if needed, or you could try in some cases to snare or use a balloon to try track the, the valve into a more optimal position, although those are less um, uh, predictable. Now, embolization, what we're talking about is much more of a problem because that's where you have an ectopic positioning of a transcatheter heart valve. Uh, and that can cause obviously severe AR, coronary obstruction, ectopy if it's in the left ventricle. And obviously when the valve goes too low and goes into the left ventricle, then almost always that needs surgery. It's extremely rare, although there have been case reports of people salvaging that situation um, I think generally surgery is what is needed. Now, if the valve uh, embolizes towards the aorta, then surgery obviously still plays a role, but interventional strategies may be helpful. And I'll talk about some of them in a second. So first of all, how frequency are valve embolization? So if you look back to the partner trial and the partner two trial, you can see that the rates are between 0.1 to 1%. Real world registry data from Germany, from Italy, show rates between 0.3 to 0.6%. So basically this is not a common phenomenon. And with newer iterations of transcatheter heart valves, with uh, more skilled operators, with experience of doing larger number of TAVIs, obviously the rates are dropping even further, but they're not zero. This data from the British Cardiac Intervention Society is slightly dated, but still shows percentages which fit with the real world data that we see elsewhere. Well, is it really that bad? I guess that's a bit of a flippant question because yes, it is. Of course, you don't want to have a valve that's in the wrong place. It would need people to convert to open surgery and has the risk of aortic dissection with a valve that's not stabilized or in the instrumentation where you're trying to optimize its position. Um, and we know that it increases mortality from previous publications. What are the causes of these uh, transcatheter heart embolizations? Well, <clears throat> the you know, first cause would be inappropriate annular sizing. I think that's less of an issue nowadays where we use CT TAVIs quite extensively for guiding the not only access for TAVI, but in choosing the optimal valve for deployment. Uh, I think previously when CT was less used and people were using TOEs, I suspect annular sizing may have been less accurate. So an undersized prosthesis obviously predisposes you to embolization. Uh, again, the fluoroscopic angle, as you know, the, the three cusp coplanar view or the, the two cusp overlap view are very important. But if you don't have your, the nadir of all your cusps, the right, the non and the left in the right angle and in the right plane, you may be tricked or fooled into thinking you're in the right place when you're clearly already too high in one of, or more of the sinuses. Um, obviously, when we're pushing the boundaries of TAVIs, <clears throat> doing off-label indications for TAVIs for pure AR with valves that aren't designed for pure AR. I know the Jenna valve is, but I'm talking about using sapiens or other self-expanding valves. Then when you're pushing the boundings and going outside the IFUs of these valves, uh, adding plus four, plus five mils to some of the valves, then you know that you're more likely to have a risk in terms of uh, embolization. Uh, 
there are specific technical factors unique to balloon expandable or self-expandable valve. For example, if the valve in a balloon expandable valve, such as the sapien, if it's not primed properly in the descending aorta, and that's where the markers of your balloon are not optimally positioned across the stent, you know that there is a risk that it, it can cause problems. Uh, if your balloon ruptures as it's inflating due to calcium, not only on the valve or in the LVOT, but in the sinotubular junction that can cause a problem. Uh, and more important for balloon than self-expanding, although still quite relevant, is pacing failure, where you have breakthrough intrinsic rhythm or ectopy that um, result in a high uh, forward throw stroke volume uh, that pushes your valve out. Um, more important for the self-expanding valves are the nose cones, uh, which are relevant to both, but particularly for the self-expanding valve, which have a less of a radial force in terms of uh, opposing them to the annulus, where they can interact with the stent struts. So there are pros and cons to each of these uh, mechanisms, and the mechanism of embolization can be unique to the type of valve, can be common, and it's just important that you're aware of them. But I don't think there's any valve that is uh, free from the risk of embolization. Uh, this is an example from, from a paper, Chen et al., which just shows where they were deploying a sapien valve, as you can see, uh, and you can see the valve has embolized in the ascending aorta here, and you can see the loss of capture when the burst pacing with the intrinsic beats and uh, coming through in between, and that is sufficient enough to, to cause a rise in your blood pressure and forward flow volume to push the valve uh, when it's not fully opposed and anchored in position. What are the treatment options? Well, the first thing, and I can't stress this enough, is don't lose your left ventricular wire. So your safari wire or your Lundacris wire that's in the left ventricle, if you lose the position of that, you make a horrible situation uh, 10 times worse. Patients may develop AR, you may need to, they may get heart block, you may need to put a temporary wire in or, or intubate them if you're doing the procedure under local anesthetic or sedation. And percutaneous strategies can in involve the use of snares, such as a gooseneck snare, an end snare to try uh, grasp the valve and, and then position it in a safer place in the aorta uh, that uh, it can be parked and left there and out of the way of a new valve that goes in position. You may need to get someone to relook at the CT to find the dimensions of the descending aorta. If you're going to park it in the descending aorta to make sure that you're putting it in a position that is not going to uh, affect the renal arteries, the mesenteric vessels or, or the celiac stream. Obviously, if someone is a candidate for surgery, that should be one of the thought processes in your mind, but obviously not all patients uh, are suitable surgical candidates. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to, uh, these are examples from other papers of people removing valves, and this is a quite nice paper by al Kuli et al. that was published in Jack, which shows a kind of nice algorithm. So if you've got an embolized valve during TAVI, maintain your wire position. You can use a snare or a biopterm. I've never used a biopterm myself, but it is something that you can technically do. Obviously, if it's in the ventricular side, surgery is the treatment of choice. You don't have any option if it's floating in the left ventricle. If the valve has embolized into the aorta, think about percutaneous strategies using a snare uh, to try capture it and then position it in a new location that is safe and out of the way. Deploy the valve there, get another valve uh, ready to be put, but it's important during the procedure to have a root cause analysis. You know, uh, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So just because you put a 26 valve in and it's embolized, if you don't know what the cause is, think twice before you put another 26 valve in and then you have two valves embolizing instead of one. So always think about it in the, in, in the moment, which is very difficult when you have all the alarms going off around you about what was the reason this valve embolized and what can I do to make it less likely to happen. So having spoken about all that, I'm going to quickly run through a few of my cases not all of these cases I've been involved. I promise I am a competent TAVI operator. You may feel otherwise after this case uh, presentations, but let's go through them. Some of them are, are cases colleagues have been involved in that they've kindly shared with me. So I've got an 86 year old lady who has normal coronaries, who has severe aortic stenosis with an Agatson score of 3000 plus. Uh, <clears throat> we went bifemoral axis with right femoral and left femoral. AL1 was used to cross the valve. You can see it's calcified with a degree of aortic regurgitation. A 23 millimeter balloon aortic valve plasty was done with a VAX balloon, and we use a transcatheter, uh, portico uh, transcatheter self expanding valve, which we positioned. Several views were taken. 
we were pretty happy with the positioning of, of, of the valve. We thought it was okay. It wasn't particularly low. And you can see aortograms in different views demonstrating that it's positioned in relation to the left coronary cusp and the right and non. Now, when we deployed the valve, you can see here on the screen on the left, there is a degree of aortic regurgitation. Um, and so we thought we would try optimize it. And so a 25 millimeter vax balloon was used to post dilate because we felt that the cells were crowded. Um, now, some people may have left the cell alone. We felt the cells were crowded. We post dilated quite aggressively. And the next picture was quite obvious. The valve was now in the ascending aorta and there was more significant aortic regurgitation. We used the snare to try move the uh, initial embolized valve more cranially. We weren't able, so we used a balloon that was inflated within the transcatheter heart valve and used to help try pull everything out. Uh, obviously, you can see it wasn't great. We lost the safari wire position, but it remained through the struts of the initial tappy, which is really important because if you lose a wire position and it goes north of the embolized valve, you may not be able to get through it and then you, you, you're in, in big trouble. Uh, a second transcatheter heart valve was used, a 27 millimeter that was positioned and deployed. There is still a degree of aortic regurgitation um, and this was accepted as the patient uh, was hemodynamically stable at the end of the case. We followed her up, her aortic valve gradients were satisfactory. She has a mild to moderate paravalvular leak, uh, but remains in NYHA class one and we accepted this. We had our surgeons involved who obviously felt that if we could do this percutaneously, that would be ideal. Hence, she wasn't taken to surgery. Now, case two, I'm going to quickly just run through. 92-year-old, we did this during the COVID pandemic, and not in our hospital. We were doing this in the private hospital. It was an, uh, a, na a national health service patient, and we were doing it with an entirely different team. So this was a Sapien 26 Ultra that was being deployed across the aortic annulus. And I'm just cutting to the chase. You can see in the first picture, the, the, the transcatheter valve is in the descending aorta. And the reason this happened was uh, we had this uh, routine that we established in our hospital. We would say pacing on, balloon up when you deploy the valve, down, pacing off. And what happened was because we were working with a new team, um, we said pacing on, the pacing burst pacing had gone on balloon up when we said down, which was meant that the, the person who was uh, using the indeflator was going down with the balloon, the, the <clears throat> physiologist thought we meant down with pacing, so switched it off when the balloon had not gone down. That resulted in a valve that embolized to the ascending aorta. We quickly pulled this with the balloon into the descending aorta into a place of safety because we knew he was a 92 year old and he was not going to be an ideal surgical candidate. Here you can see on the screen on the right, we're post dilating this balloon because we want to anchor it. And that's quite important because if you don't park the balloon safely and inflate it properly, the next valve is going to struggle to get across. And you can see as we're putting the next valve, it's moving the original valve more cranial. So uh, it's quite important that you make sure that the valve is in a position that it's not going to go and get pulled back into the ascending aorta where it'll cause more mischief. We then deploy a second valve. This time, you can see a temporary wire is in position, and that's important because now we, we just take any issues from pacing out of the equation, and we obviously don't say down this time. The balloon comes down, we ask pacing off once the balloon's fully off, and we're happy. And this patient did quite well, and you can see on the aortogram here on, on the right, we're checking for patency of the renal arteries to make sure that we, did, we didn't include them. Uh, but this was a position that the valve was, we were happy with and it was satisfactory. Again, the patient has done well over follow-up. I'm just going to quickly rattle through this one. This is quite an interesting case. Um, this was a patient who had an Agatston score of six and a half thousand. You can see a very horizontal and hostile aorta. We pre-dilated with a, a 20 millimeter Vax balloon and she developed significant aortic regurgitation. Now, what was interesting is when we primed the, the valve and the descending aorta, when we unlocked and took tension off the valve, no matter what we did, the balloon would slip. And as you can see, it's not isocentered on the stent strut. So you can see it's gone down a bit. And we were struggling and we tried this three or four times. And then eventually when we got it in place, when we positioned the valve in the right position, as soon as the flexion catheter came back, the balloon slipped forward. 
And the options we had when discussing it with a valve wrap was to take everything out, which would be a problem, valve and sheet end block, because you can't remove the valve once you've taken it through the sheet, or to deploy it. And given that the patient was deteriorating with AR, we decided to deploy it. Not a good idea, as you can tell from the title of this talk, but you can see what happens. High calcium score, the balloon melon seeds down into the ventricle, and the valve is half inflated and goes up. Now we recognize this straight away, so we deflated the balloon, we kept on pacing, and we pulled the entire system end block, leaving the safari in the LV into the descending aorta. And then you can see now where we're now post dilating it aggressively and inflating it to get a good result. Now that we've post dilated it, another valve goes in position and we get a good result in this patient. This was not affecting the flow of the blood supply to the splanchnic vessel or, or to any other vessels. And you can see that there's flow going down. And you can see how hostile this aorta is uh, in this patient. And this is what we thought was the mechanism of why the balloon kept on um, um, slipping off the stent or the TAVI valve because of the tension in the system. Uh, I'm going to just skip other, uh, other cases because I know I've talked for quite a bit of time. And the last thing I'd say is know when to stop. This was a case when we spent quite a lot of time snaring. The patient developed a pericardial effusion. And as you can see here, we've snared this portico valve higher up. It's gone into the ascending aorta. The patient developed a pericardial effusion and AR. And obviously with a pericardial effusion, we knew that we must have caused some damage to the ascending aorta. And she went for surgery, uh, but did quite well because she was a younger patient in her mid seventies. I just want to summarize and say, be aware of the pitfalls that you may encounter during TAVI. In valve embolization, it's important to assess the suitability for surgery. And this is really important as we go to a younger, lower risk cohort in doing TAVI, uh, consistent with a partner three type patient. It's important in these patients, if they're suitable for surgery, do think about surgery as your first port of call if there isn't a quick fix. If you think that surgery is not ideal and your surgeons are involved in this mini MDT in the cath lab, you may decide to, to try park this redundant embolized valve into a safer place. And, you know, there is no place that's ideal, but a place that's not likely to cause coronary obstruction when a new valve is put in, a place where it's not likely to obstruct flow to the, 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 the main vessels going to the head and neck or to the splanchnic vessels in the descending aorta. It's always important, as you know, pacing, when you overdrive pacing, make sure you check it, make sure the team are, on, are, are following the same instruction and don't uh, have issues with wire control. That's extremely important. Know your snares because they can be a friend in need uh, when you're in trouble. And whatever you do, don't lose your LV wire because then you may be in a non-salvageable position. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Majid. Uh, this uh, were in interesting uh, case, cases and some lessons for anybody that's uh, around. So I uh, I uh, hand over again to Fahad uh, to uh, run the uh, discussion, the panel discussion at this point in time. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. So uh, it's a great talk, Majid. Uh, it's always take a lot of courage to show complications, uh, but always uh, we say it's done by a colleague or it's the fault of the fellow beside you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyhow, it's our time for question and answer. I would like to encourage the audience also if they have any questions or comment to submit it. And uh, my colleagues, the speakers and panelists, if you have any questions or comment for all the talks, please feel free. Excellent talk, Dr. Akhtar. Um, I think my question to the panelists and the, to the speakers is that we know that, I mean, luckily complications are extremely low, but what kind of, um, when you're doing pre-procedure and planning, is, is there a discussion as far as how much can you go with surgery? Are there people where you're saying they're inoperable and if something happens, I'm just going to do everything precutaneously and that's it? And is it part of your discussion with the patient as well? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that is a very good question. Yes, we do have that thought process. I think what's important is when we're consenting them, you know, obviously we quote the risk of emergent conversion to open surgery. 
For patients that who are non-surgical candidates, we explicitly mentioned to them that we will not do that unless we feel there's a quick fix that, for example, you know, a perforation from a temporary wire that we feel we can be treated very quickly. I think when you're talking about, you know, surgical treatment for an embolized valve, where it's difficult to cross clamp the aorta, particularly if you remember the first case I had where you've got two transcatheter self-expanding valve, I think you're turning a situation that is likely to have the same outcome, uh, but just more prolonged. So we're very clear with patients that aren't surgical candidates. When we do have a catastrophic complication that does need surgery, our surgeons are not in the cath lab, but they're, they're a phone call away and they, they will be there within five minutes. They're on site when we do these cases. And then we have a quick informal MDT discussion, usually between two TAVI cardiology operators and a surgeon about what we think the next best port of call is. And if you have someone who's clearly a surgical candidate, that's the way we go. If we have someone who's not a surgical candidate, then we try quite hard with snares. Okay, good. We have a question from uh, Mu'taz Salama. It's also for you, Dr. Majid. Uh, do you think automated CT overlap technique can help solving valve migration? So, sorry, I didn't catch that. Automated lab technique. C C automated lab CT overlap technique. Oh, I see. Okay, so on to Flora. So I don't have experience with that. We don't have that. I have to say, I don't particularly think that it will change things. I think when you look at a lot of the common causes as to why a valve has embolized, a lot of it is things that you would have identified in your pre-procedural planning that you should have uh, understood. It could be uh, patients with low calcium scores, patients who have, um, um, you know, uh, a sinus of valsalva that's shallow or a sinus tuber junction that's going to interact with your valve frame. People where you feel that you're going to have an issue with overdrive pacing for whatever reason. So I think a lot of these things are kind of things that you only identify in the cath lab when it's done where your nose cone interacts and pulls the valve out as you're removing the delivery system, for example. I don't think CT is going to help at that point of uh, call. I think CT plays an extremely important point beforehand, in making sure you're choosing the right valve and you know the limits of what you're doing. And where you have cases where you're not going to be using the right valve, you need to be referring to a center that can do that. For example, for the low calcium scores or the pure ARs. Yes, Majid. Uh, I think the key is the pre-planning and the sizing and also while pacing, it's very important. And calcium I know calcium is uh, an enemy for the interventionist, but we need it in TAVI or TAVR. Uh, so the next question is from Ahmed Samir. And his question is about tips and tricks starting from valve choice and device manipulation and hostile horizontal aorta. Thomas, I'll give you that question. If you have any tips and tricks for hostile horizontal aorta. You are mute. You are mute. So if you unmute, Majid, that's uh, that's better for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a tricky one. Obviously, you know, when you see a horizontal aorta, you just, I mean, first of all, you still need to make sure your deployment angle is accurate. Um, you need to make sure that there isn't a lot of tension on the system. That's extremely important, particularly with, with the horizontal aorta because of the migration, either cranially or caudally. Um, you know, you can use a, a, a stiffer wire, you could use a Linderquist instead of a Safari if you want to. Uh, there are cases where people have used a buddy wire up until the point of valve deployment that I've never used myself personally. But I think, you know, there are other options that you can do. Uh, you know, one of the other ex uh, advantages of self-expanding valves are you can, you know, if you've got the right amount of calcium, you can make sure your valve um, as you're deploying it is anchoring nicely before you let go, they're recapturable up to a certain degree. With balloon expandable, that's less likely an option. Uh, you know, personally, I've used self-expanding and balloon expandable in horizontal aorta, depending on other factors. But I think you've got a few tricks, such as changing your wire, making sure that there isn't tension on the system. Uh, happy for anyone else to comment if they feel other opinions. Abdullah, do you have any tips and tricks for this for hostile horizontal aorta? So uh, I agree with all the points uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Majid. And I think it's very important to make sure that um, horizontal aorta, if you're using self-expandable valve, that the last movement is forward, make sure that the valve is uh, 
you know, you have a certain forward pressure, maybe you start a bit lower than the lower than you would normally do for a normal valve, I would pace at a higher rate uh, to stabilize the valve more. But if it's really extremely horizontal, uh, I, I have to be honest, I tend to be more comfortable with balloon expandable, I find it to be more predictable uh, in this situation. Okay, so uh, we're having more questions. So uh, the next question is uh, by Asam Hameda. So, uh, sorry, Tavi is good option for paradoxical severe AS or still uh, SAVR is the main option according to guidelines. I guess the guidelines, uh, Thomas. Well, the, the, uh, the guidelines don't specifically uh, uh, dissociate uh, the two and uh, are mainly focusing on, on surgical risk and uh, age, uh, as well as, of course, other uh, anatomical factors. So uh, I don't think we, we, can, uh, we can make a, a good recommendation. The evidence actually is not very good anyway under these conditions. Uh, so another question for you, Thomas, from Khalid Alawafi from Muscat. Uh, what about the asymptomatic super severe aortic stenosis, say velocity of above five and gradient of above 55 with regards to timing of valve replacement? Well, you know, uh, in principle that the, uh, <clears throat> the last ESC guidelines are a bit less conservative. They do leave an option to treat patients uh, with very severe uh, aortic stenosis, particularly if they have a left ventricular dysfunction. But the more recent sort of rather small trials, as I mentioned, the Avatar trial and the Korean trial with around overall about 300 uh, odd patients strongly suggest that uh, the um, earlier um, treatment is actually better for outcome. And in principle, I don't see why symptoms should be such a strong sim uh, decision maker as we have it now, because uh, symptoms are often difficult to assess because if you put the patient on the bike or on the treadmill, usually they do have symptoms. Uh, many patients, particularly uh, at that, uh, the elderly patients, they don't move as much and then they tell you that they don't have symptoms. But for their outcome, it is not wise to wait too long. But as I said, because the evidence is only derived now for two trials that were published uh, after the discussion of the uh, last guidelines have been uh, finalized and therefore are not included in the guidelines, but nevertheless, they suggest that uh, we shouldn't wait too long uh, because there's increasing evidence that severe, very severe stenosis without symptoms probably is better off when you uh, go ahead with a either SOVR or TOVR, depending on the criteria that we uh, discussed earlier. Okay, we have one more question as well. How good an impella device work through a TAVI valve? So, Brasha or Abdullah? Uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, my experience with impella is actually pre TAVI, so put it uh, as a bridge and then TAVI after. But um, I think that what I, my, my concern is that putting it in a fresh valve is that you might also get the risk of any valve migration. But if needed, um, maybe could be done with very um, careful manipulation. Uh, the the goal is uh, I'm not sure if there's any long term benefit or long term effects on the valve itself and the leaflets as the natives. Uh, there's really not much uh, that we know uh, of impella on Tavi, um, but I would stay away from putting it in a fresh one. Yep. So, uh, Russia, while I'm having you. Uh, for sure, we have like uh, coronary artery disease coexisting with severe AS. What's your current approach uh, in your center regarding uh, presence of coronary artery disease? And uh, do you do them pre-TAVI, post-TAVI, when you do them? So if you can highlight some of your uh, approach regarding this. <clears throat> 
Yeah, it's a very good question. It's, in, it's always debatable as far as the timing. That's from me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, as far as actually, um, my my teaching was all about doing a coronary angiogram as a mandatory technique before all TAVIs um, as part of the discussion point before we discuss TAVI. Um, but actually, I'm, we stayed away from it and we're relying heavily on our CT. We're doing a really good job at catching the coronary disease with CT TAVI protocol. So if we don't see anything, we go ahead and proceed, obviously. If you see anything that's moderate or more, we tend to bring them. Um, Anything in the proximal vessels, we tend to do it. Branches, OMs, diagonals, uh, distal RCA, treat them medically, um, unless they're having symptoms. But we typically do it before. But there are a few occasions where we're doing it at the same time if we think the contrast is not going to be a lot, uh, not bifurcation or challenging cases that we need any calcium modification techniques. Um, so typically before um, and few cases at the same site. I would also have a question when you want to use a, a six French system and you cannot engage it. Uh, what about using a guideliner to overcome the problem? Yeah, uh, very good point. It's been actually reported that you could use your wire and use either a balloon or a guideline and to help you rail the guide into the uh, the catheter. The selection of the guide at that point was before knowing that I'm gonna be dealing with a bifurcation lesion. So uh, if I knew that ahead of time, I would have definitely gone for a six French uh, with one of these maneuvers. But that would have been a thing to keep in mind if you need to switch or you lost your guide. Uh, I made a comment, uh, uh, Dr. Rekha, uh, regarding your case. I think given that the case was a, a non-STEMI, uh, a CT uh, could have been helpful to see the orientation of the valves relating to the ostia. I mean, if you look at the, your floral, I noticed that the C tabs of the two valves are 180 degrees of to, toward each other, suggesting that probably chances are high that one of the valve has a significant misalignment and may be standing in your way with regards to the left main axis. So knowing this before, before doing the angiogram can be, can be helpful, I think. Yeah, I agree. There's actually a good paper about the CT and how you can predict feasibility or non-feasibility of coronary engagement. And as you mentioned, one of them is the alignment. There's also a report of the valve to the STJ. So if it's less than two millimeter, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to engage. Um, but um, I think in this case, knowing that we're going to have to do any intervention at the same time, um, went ahead with an intervention. But I think the general idea is to use a, a guide that's small. 0.5 smaller than you would normally do after after you have a tabby in. And I think the fact that you had to go femoral was, was good because then usually in these cases, you need to do a lot of uh, maneuvering of the catheter. So in these cases, I find it's one of the few cases where I think femoral first can be uh, helpful. Yeah, the the, uh, the teachings are usually left radial for post tabby. It's usually better than right radial, um, just so that it would give you the same uh, angulation that you would get from the femoral. But in this case, he made it easier for us not having a good radial. <laughs> so that was a plus. Um, one probably comment is that um, it's interesting how the European guidelines that now talk about doing a TAVI for people who are uh, greater than 75. Now, using that cutoff, it seems like the Americans are usually less than that, around 65. But uh, when you look at our Gulf population, uh, life expectancy is a lot less. So should we go by these guidelines or hopefully we'll have our own data to dictate what's probably good for our population? But using the 75 cutoff might not be that relevant to our population too. Well, in many countries, uh, <clears throat> particularly, I would say in the United Kingdom, we're a bit more conservative. In Germany and in Switzerland, uh, people uh, above 65 are, are generally more and more considered for TAVI. Now, the main problem, of course, is, uh, the life, is the, not the life expectancy of the patient itself, but the valve. And the question is, can we, can we derive the data from the uh, surgical valves or are they uh, tissue damage uh, breaks when you, when you crimp the valve, uh, compare, which is not the case when uh, the surgeons use a bioprosthesis. So maybe it, it is possible that, uh, that, it, uh, that the longevity of these valves is, uh, is a bit less than the surgical ones. I think that's the main concern because the very long-term data the, you know, after uh, of ten years and or longer, 
uh, is particularly in the European population still an issue. So what is the life expectancy in, in your country then in general? It's in the 70s. 70s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the UK is a bit more and in, in Germany and Switzerland, it's above 80, yes. Yeah. So for us, 75 is, is very elderly and yeah, I think it's, the cutoff will be around 65. Yeah. 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 Well, we will, we will also gain more and more experience uh, with, uh, with younger patients and um, and in some, you know, you, you have no choice. Uh, we also at Airfield, we had a 55 year old lady that already had the second operation because she had a bicuspid valve that was first operated at uh, age 35. And then uh, uh, later on at age 45, uh, with a, again, a degeneration. And uh, in this case, uh, one has to talk to the patient and we decided to go for a valve and valve because, uh, uh, you know, a third uh, operation opening the chest uh, uh, was considered quite high risk and the patient uh, really was not uh, ready to, to go for that. Uh, Abdullah, talk about cerebral protection, I mean, uh... Do you do it in all cases or just valve and valve? Uh, or you have certain uh, population that use uh, cerebral protection? Because, uh, you know, the guidelines is, it seems like a good idea, but we don't have still uh, uh, good, strong trials. I mean, there is ongoing ones, but uh, what's your current practice for cerebral protection? You know, to be honest, to me, the worst complication is stroke, especially a massive stroke. That's the worst complication that you can give to a patient. And I think our current practice in my center is that we would use uh, cerebral protection in the uh, valve and valve, so all valve and valve uh, cases, cases that we plan to do valve fracture, cases we're going to do basilica, and in valves that we have a significant amount of calcifications that we see on the CT, uh, beforehand and the younger patients. And I think the more, uh, the more cerebral protection you would use as an operator, the more comfortable that you become with the device, then your, your threshold goes down with time. That's, that's part of. Uh, yeah, the, unfortunately, the trial data are not very positive contrary to intuition. I agree that if you do a basilica, probably the, the risk of embolization is so high that it's very wise to do it. But most likely uh, the, uh, the placement of the device itself has a risk of stroke. That's why probably so far the trials were not very convincing or I, I, I'm happy to hear your, your, uh, your explanation why the trials have been a bit disappointing so far. I kind of echo what uh, Dr. Abdullah was mentioning is that stroke is usually as a complication of a procedure tends to be very debil not only in terms of morbidity, but also as a mortality. So there's a recent publication in Jack that they looked at the stroke risk is about 2.3%, but those who have severe symptoms tend to have mortality of up to the 70%. So even with a newer intervention, they might improve um, just a little bit in, in their symptoms, but the mortality stays high. Um, the, the question about cerebral embolic protection device, as, uh, as we obviously all know, is that we don't have any heart outcome data yet to prove it, but uh, we're all staying tuned for TCT protected TAVR trial. Uh, Dr. Samir Kapani will be presenting data about 3,000 patients who had Sentinel device, and they're looking for a clinical stroke within 72 hours. So hopefully that will shed some light on this topic. And if it becomes positive, we'll definitely see a, a huge trend in going up on with the cerebral and valve protection devices. So Dr. Rasha, what's your current practice regarding the cerebral protection? Uh, is we it do for it all or selected? Selective. Uh, and obviously the criteria is based on what we think theoretically have higher risk. So BAV, lots of calcium, um, anything in the mitral, um, typically we would do it. But um, again, uh, I don't think we have data definitely to prove it, but theoretical concerns mostly.
Majid. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd echo what everyone else has said previously. I mean, the, 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 tri the data is lacking and it's as disappointing as, you know, thrombus aspiration in STEMIs. You, you just know that when you suck out a big clot that you've done some good and protected them from harm. And the same applies when you, your basket from your sentinel device is full of calcium and you just think, well, you know, this could not have done any good if it went to the brain. The problem is it's not funded in the UK and with a lack of evidence base at this point in time, we do it in selected cases. So we do it for our lampoons, our basilicas, anything where we're electrifying uh, a guide wire in, in the arterial system, we'll use it. Very high calcium scores, but again, what is a very high calcium score? Generally, we'll use it for over 5,000 agatston, um, but it's on an individual basis, but selected again. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we are going to move to uh, our sponsored uh, symposium. Uh, we have uh, Valve and Valve Tower, optimizing hemodynamic, hemodynamics in small valves. Um, we have our colleague, Dr. Mahmoud Trena, a senior interventional cardiologist from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. We'd like to welcome him and hear from him about valve and valve and optimizing the hemodynamics. Can you see my screen, Dr. Fad? Thank you very much. Yeah. Still loading. Okay. Let me just stop it for a second. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to join such a esteemed panel. Um, it was a great talks, very fantastic uh, cases. Um, really enjoyed it. So I think uh, hopefully this is a little bit of a more simple case, but I think just to bring up a couple of uh, issues with, uh, with valve and valve uh, tavern. So I'll this primarily present within the context of a case. Uh, so we had a 58 year old female with a history. So this kind of brings up the point uh, uh, Dr. Lusher brought up and young patients. Um, we see a lot more young patients in this region um, that come to us. Uh, so this is a 58 year old female history by cuspid aortic valve status plus a bioprosthetic AVR with a perimount 23 and a supracoronary aortic replacement in 2012. Uh, now she's had her second heart failure admission, um, and she's referred for aortic valve replacement. She's had a progressive increase in her gradients over her routine follow-up. Not much in the way of comorbidities. Her echo shows a, a EF of 50%, uh, peak and mean gradients of 77 over 43, but uh, significant pulmonary hypertension was present. Just her echo showing LV function, Valves deterioration, reduced opening, some mild aortic regurgitation. And again, just low normal uh, LV function. So our cath, I, I didn't show the CT, but I think the cath illustrates the uh, coronary findings in terms of a uh, very good coronary height bilaterally. Um, left height is good, right height is good and no significant coronary artery disease. So in terms of her uh, right heart cath findings, um, so this is after actually quite a bit of diuresis, uh, inpatient diuresis, she was still at a high right atrial pressure of 19, um, had RV pressures of 90 over 21, mean PA pressure was 53 and a wedge of 25, uh, mildly reduced cardiac output and a high PVR. And uh, even after uh, several doses of nitroglycerin, her PA pressure remained elevated and PVR remained elevated. 
So she came to our her team for a discussion. Uh, SCS score actually did not, as you expect in a 58 year old, did not calculate out too high. Uh, it was 3.6%, but uh, SCS doesn't account for pulmonary hypertension. Um, so kind of the factors, obviously this is her, would be her first redo. So she's not a second redo, it'd be first redo, but her age would favor redo surgery. Uh, but mostly fixed presence of mostly fixed pulmonary hypertension would favor TAVR um, in the discussion. And uh, overall, the team decision was to proceed with TAVR after a detailed discussion with the patient and their family. So in terms of the outcomes of uh, TAVR across STS groups, and this kind of makes sense. I like this uh, table, but this is from the, uh, uh, the valve registries but shows that for each specific STS score, whether you look at the high risk group versus the intermediate risk group versus the low risk group, valve and valve TAVR actually has better outcomes than native TAVR. And if you think about it, for if your initial thought would be that it doesn't make sense, but when you think about it, the STS score in valve and valve is driven not by the comorbidities, but is driven by the redo operation. So that's what's increasing the surgical risk, but that risk is not present as, mu as much so in, this, in the setting of, uh, of TAVR. So, so the redo risk is not present there. And so that's why for each specific STS score, um, patients uh, valve and valve actually have better outcomes than, than native uh, valves. When we look at multivariate analysis of outcome, uh, what, what leads to increased mortality, Besides, obviously, the clinical factors, as you would expect, poor functional capacity, reduced hemoglobin, poor LVEF, presence of severe TR, um, and kidney dysfunction. But if we look at the, from a technical perspective, the patients leaving with high gradients, so poor hemodynamics, um, mean gradients over 20, or the patient presence of a patient prosthesis mismatch really increases the risk of uh, mortality in these valve and valve patients. So those are kind of, the hemodynamics are, are very important to achieve good hemodynamics in these patients. So I think as, as, as Dr. Uh, Abdullah, you know, very nicely delineated, I, I mean, we're deci making decisions on these patients in terms of valve selections um, for a valve and valve case. There's basically two important sets of issues um, that we need to discuss. So what's the, what's the status of the coronaries? Is the uh, coronary ask access important? And where, what's the coronary height, adequate or low? I think in the setting of, of uh, major risk to the coronaries or difficulty with the coronaries, a smaller profile balloon expandable valve will be, a, will be probably a, a better choice. But when it comes to hemodynamics, I think that that's where other issues come up. So I think the, the issue, and we see this a lot, as uh, Dr. Abdullah mentioned, in, in our region, there's a lot of small valves, a lot of smaller people, so smaller valves. Um, and so the size of the initial valve, is it small? And is better hemodynamics important, especially when you're targeting younger and younger patients? Um, we're really looking at a 10, 15 year outcome rather than a five year outcome. And we'll show the data kind of suggests that that, that, that valve hemodynamics really start to make a difference at, after five years. So this is kind of looking at the, uh, what's achieved in the, in the registries um, post TAVR in terms of uh, all valve and valve patients. And the hemodynamics are worse in valve and valve patients. So that's important to, 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 to note compared to uh, native valves. And the post TAVR echoes generally mean gradients were about 11, 12 and that discharge echoes are up to 17. So the, the gradients in all valve and valve are worse, but are particularly worse when you're talking about small, small annuli um, or small initial valves, surgical valves. So they, those gradients can be up to 20. So, so we have to really focus on achieving as best hemodynamics in those patients as possible. And when you look at the vivid registry, it's really an eight year point where this, uh, the high mean gradients start to fail. So that's, that seems like it's turning point. I think if, we're, if you're looking at a patient who has, who has a life expectancy in that four to five year range, 
relatively high gradient may not be as much of an issue, but, but patients with longer life expectancy, you're gonna have earlier failure um, if you're not able to get a good low gradient in these patients. This is from the uh, PARTNER2 trial, um, the valve and valve registry component. And uh, we can see here that predictors of all-cause mortality, obviously the SDS score predicts uh, worse mortality uh, over time, but smaller valves also do worse. So patients that got 23 XTs, this is pre-SAPM3s, pre um, 23 XTs had a worse outcome than those that got 26 XTs. So, um, so smaller valves, worse hemodynamics tend to do worse. And as uh, and some of the patients that got the smaller valves were those that had smaller surgical valves. So smaller surgical valves is a poor predictor of outcomes. And I think this kind of needs to be taken into account at least as one of the factors when in the heart team discussion about uh, what to do, especially as we get some of these younger bicuspid patients that come back for, for surgery at a relatively young age. So as mentioned, uh, everybody knows, everybody who works in the space kind of is aware these, uh, like Dr. Abdullah sh showed an example, these valve and valve, aortic and valve and valve mitral apps are fantastic. Um, really, really well done and kind of give you good information. So if we look at our valve, which is a Paramount 2700, um, 23 millimeters. So the true ID of these valves are always less um, and it's a 21 um, true ID for this valve. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, a, a rem, uh, uh, can be remodeled, not fractured. It's expandable valve. Um, and if we look at the choices, when we get into the choices of what, what we can use, we can go either with a Sapien 23 or Evolute 26 if we're, if we're focusing on those two valves um, to maintain good hemodynamics. Also very, very important when you're doing a valve and valve is to know what valve, um, as was mentioned, what valve uh, is present. And so the classification of the bioprocess is extremely important. The valve type, the valve size, almost all you can figure them out usually by the, um, by the uh, fluoroscopic appearance. If, if you don't have an op report, obviously the op report's always, always ideal. Um, but, um, you know, I've done it on cases where I wasn't sure and gone through them on the, on the app and can kind of figure out, uh, which, which valve it is, um, you know, and then these can tell you which valve is fractureable. So the, this column, are, the valve can actually be fractured, um, as the magna was in that last case, these valves can be remodeled so they can be expanded and reshaped, but can be fully fractured. And these valves. Uh, the Hancocks supposedly can be can be a remodel of fractures, but uh, but I've done a case and I've seen a few cases um, where it probably can be remodeled at least or, or attempted remodeling, um, and where you can get improved hemodynamics. So so most valves can be at least remodeled, if not uh, fully fractured, to get a to get a better result. And I think this is these are as we're learning and we're you know. Taver is expanding. We, we're asking our surgical colleagues as well more and more to be better about their valve choices and putting in bigger valves um, in the first uh, first surgery because once you get a bigger valve in the first surgery, it allows you to get a bigger valve in the follow-up procedure um, when it in inevitably will fail if the, hopefully the patient lives, lives long enough and valves like the Inspiris valve um, which can be fully um, expanded are, uh, are uh, great choices in the modern day. Now, when it comes to uh, the technique, um, really high positioning is, uh, is really key um, when you're doing a valve and valve. Um, probably the best way to maintain good hemodynamics. Um, so decreased gradients are achieved with high positioning. And this is kind of, um, from sapien data, but but can be same can be said for uh, the superannular valves, um, um, like the Evolute. So in this case, as an example, this 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 was done in an animal model. But but if you put in a high, uh, if you get a high implant, you get the gradient down to 17. If the gradient if the implant is low, you'll get a mean gradient of 41. So so low implants really drive up the gradients across the board. Um, and you know you need to put the 
evolve and you can see here at the opening this is with the evolute if you put it at a high you get a much better opening less pruning of the valve um, no matter how much you post dilate if you put it in low it's going to be uh, hard to get good gradients across that valve and in multivariate analysis and in, in registry data this the same issue so there's two the two factors that 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 show um, that that predict elevated gradients are a high implant is protective against the gradient and uses of an of a core valve or evolute uh, in the current day superannular valve is going to improve your gradient so between those two factors uh, if if, uh, if gradients important and hemodynamics important for that specific patient those are really what are going to optimize your hemodynamics um, for long-term uh, efficacy and results for the patient and also it helps to reduce your, improves all your other outcomes. So, you know, for a valve and valve, if you're putting it in high, there should be no increased risk of pacemaker. Pacemaker rate really should be zero if you're putting it at a high implant rate um, because whatever pacemaker rate was going to be achieved was going to be achieved from the first valve. So, so uh, unless you're getting further down into the annulus, um, you won't really have much pacemaker rate. High implants also have lower rates of perivalvular leak and, of course, improve hemodynamics. This is our case, so with femoral access, so we use primarily single-sided access unless there's a, a lot of disease um, on the case. Here's the uh, valve positioning. Kind of it's a, a little bit slow, so it's uh, just the positioning, make sure we're catching it just at the lower aspect of the or the where the non coronary cusp would have been on that side slow pacing kind of to make sure repositioning it pulled it up a little bit to catch it just at the really positioning it just at the bottom edge of the of the prior valve paramount valve this is kind of just an image showing showing the valve uh, being released here we're happy with with that height we're expecting the left side to kind of come up um, a little bit as we release very slow release given it's a high high positioning just to make sure we don't get the horrible migrations uh, and embolizations that we we saw in those uh, bad complications unfortunate and so yeah even slower than than normal um, on this release And so this is our post deployment angiogram so so really after deployment looks looks good but you can still see at least like uh dr majid mentioned about how the stress so it still looks a little crowded you see it's not fully expanded down here but again no no leak no ai um you know again if you were you could say this is a reasonable result and accept it mean gradient 17 is under 20 but but again you 58 year old patient you're trying to give her as long of a result as uh, as you can before she needs a another procedure hopefully she doesn't need two more in her lifetime uh, we decided to post dilate mm -hmm. um, uh, to remodel the valve and this doesn't fracture it's not going to give like the uh, the magnet did on that last case but uh, but it does modify you can kind of see it here pop out at the bottom there and kind of get more expansion along the uh along the old valve and so you can see a clear difference here um final image just a fluoroscopic image showing this this uh, area on the left side that was kind of not as well expanded clearly expanded better and uh, we're able to get her mean gradient down to eight finally. So she was uh, sent home the next day. Um, follow up, she remained clinically stable. Mean gradient is eight on echocardiogram. And so hopefully, hoping to give her a, a little bit longer uh, results in, and uh, before she needs a, a third procedure. 
So just some uh, take home um, for valve and valve type of cover. Uh, I think uh, high implantation should be used no matter the valve type, whether you're using a self-expanding or balloon expandable valve. Um, I think uh, high implantation is, is really important to, in, in all cases, in all TAVR cases, I think that's been shown, but uh, mostly for pacemaker uh, rates. But if, I think for hemodynamics is even more important in the setting of, uh, of valve and valve TAVR. Uh, the hemodynamics are superior with self-expanding superannular valves like the Evolute, um, especially with this, with the smaller annuli, which are common in our region. Um, we have a lot of, uh, you know, we use if when we're using we're using a lot more 26s and and Evolutes and 23s in uh, in uh, Sapiens uh, out here. So so we we're dealing with a lot more of these smaller annuli, and I think this is one case in the valve and valve case where the hemodynamics are important, more important in valve and valve cases. The valve selection should be a balance between the, the uh, risk of coronary obstruction and access and the hemodynamics. I think each case kind of needs to be evaluated on its own merits and decide which, which one is, seen, is more important for the long term and, uh, and help guide your, your decision making. And then finally, routine post-dilation of valve and valve cases is really essential for optimal long-term outcomes. Thank you. Mahmoud, thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent talk and uh, uh, good selection of a case for valve and valve and how to optimize the hemodynamics. And also would like to uh, thank uh, Metronic for sponsoring this session as well. Unfortunately, as everything good in life has to come to an end, we are coming to uh, an end of our uh, session. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, my partner, um, Royal Brampton, Dr. Thomas Rutcher, Majid Akhtar, and also my friends from the Gulf region, uh, Dr. Arash al uh, Dr. Abdullah al -Anizi, Dr. Mahmoud Trena, so thank you very much. And also would like to thank the audience for uh, uh, their involvement. And also I would like to thank the Gulf Intervention Society and have a nice and lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.